Hi, Ridge Christian Fellowship. Um, uh, this morning, we're going to be turning back into our sermon series, uh, The Life You Were Built For. And I recognize, obviously, in the midst of the coronavirus and a lot of things have been changing, uh, one of the things I want to remind us of and point us back to uh, is our mission as a church. Uh, the mission of the, of the Ridge Christian Fellowship uh, is to love God and to love people. And, and we do that by proclaiming the gospel both by our words and by our actions. I had a call uh, just a couple days ago from a good friend of mine, and she reminded me uh, of that. She said, you know, that really the mission of the Ridge Christian Fellowship hasn't changed. Uh, we, are, we are still, uh, our heart's desire is still to proclaim the gospel in everything that we do, uh, to love people, uh, to think about others. Um, the way that we do that, obviously, is changing over the next uh, couple weeks, at least until this uh, storm blows over. And that was, those words were uh, very encouraging to me. So I want to turn us back to our sermon series that we were in a few weeks back before all of this kind of happened and before I had, I had gotten sick with the flu a couple weeks ago. But looking back at, at the life that we were built for, uh, one of the things that we want to recognize is that in the midst of all this chaos and all this confusion, uh, the life that you were built for has not changed. Uh, the, the mission, the essential mission of the church has not changed. Uh, the mission of your life and what God has called you to do has not changed. And so we're going to be looking at that. Uh, we're going to be, uh, this morning, we're going to be in a couple other passages uh, from the New Testament, a little bit in 2 Corinthians and Luke 13, but we are moving back into Colossians uh, for the sake of, our, of this sermon series. One of the things that we consider, you know, if you look at a battlefield, if you think about our mission as being on, on the battlefield of this earth, uh, you know, mission doesn't change. Uh, a lot of times in the Marine Corps, they would tell us that once, uh, once the, the plans are made and the, and the mission is set, uh, you know, you go out to the battlefield and, and you think you, you understand, okay, here's how we're going to execute the mission. Here's how we're going to maneuver. Here's how we're going to uh, maneuver around the enemy. And here's how we're going to fight. A lot of times, once that first round is fired, uh, once uh, the, the, the explosions start going, um, going off, once the, the fog of war, sometimes they call it the confusion of war sets in, a lot of those things go out the window. Um, and, but the mission still remains the same. The mission of what we are looking to accomplish is exactly the same, and that's what we're going to be looking at. Uh, in the famous uh, words of uh, the great theologian Mike Tyson, he said, everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. And in a sense, so what we're experiencing maybe is, is some punches uh, in the face, but uh, we're going to get through this. Uh, everything is going to be okay. Uh, the mission of God and the kingdom of God is going to advance. Um, a friend of mine um, a couple weeks ago said, that you know, all of the devil's intentions and, and purposes and plans to thwart the kingdom of God and to fight against the kingdom of God. In the end, all of those things that the devil tries to do will in the end only be seen as having advanced the kingdom of God. And I believe that uh, 100%. So this morning, what I want to do is to give two responses, two biblical responses to the coronavirus. We're going to be looking at uh, a couple passages here. Obviously, there's lots of things that could be said. There's a hundred responses we could give to this uh, in thinking about suffering broadly in thinking about the coronavirus in particular. Uh, but I just want to share a couple things uh, with you th uh, this morning to, s to think about, okay, how can we begin to, to process this and what should, we be think what should we be thinking about uh, as a church as we maneuver uh, through this? So the first thing I want to share with you is to allow Christ to be your comfort. Uh, in the midst of all the fear and the chaos and, and, and sometimes maybe the underreaction of some, maybe the overreaction of others, uh, to allow the comfort of God to be with you. And, and th these words come from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses, verses 3 and 5. Look at what it says. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us, in verse 4 he says, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God for as we share in abundantly in the Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. And there's a couple things I want to just point out here really quick from this passage. First, it says that we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, which means that Christians are not immune to suffering. That there's nothing in the Bible that promises that Christians are immune from disease or from illness or from death or from tragedy. But with that, with that comes the promise of comfort. And so what these passages are offering to us is genuine comfort. And, and this is what God is offering to you and to me and to all of us who desire it in, in this kind of chaotic time. It is the comfort that comes from God himself. But the purpose, something else I want you to notice, and in verse 4 it says the purpose of our comfort is not just so that I'm comforted. Of course God wants to comfort me and of course I want comfort, but I want you to notice what it says. 
that God who comforts us in all our affliction, not just some of our affliction, but that God who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that, that's a purpose statement, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So the reason why this passage is saying that God comforts me and brings me comfort in my affliction isn't just so that Jeremiah can have comfort, but so that I can share that comfort with other people, so that I can share that with my wife and my children and my neighbor and to people I'm rubbing shoulders with at Costco or if I'm waiting in line to get my oil changed at the the mechanic shop. So one of the things that we want to do as Christians in the midst of this, the reason that you're here, the life that you were built for was a life of comfort in the sense of being comforted by the Spirit of God and then extending that comfort to other people in the midst of suffering and in the midst of affliction. Now, of course, the problem and the difficulty with this, uh, the, the issue that we face is, if I'm not being comforted, how can I give that comfort to other people? If, if I'm allowing my heart and my spirit and my soul to be filled with fear and anxiety and, and, and turmoil, then how can I comfort people who are around me? How can I comfort my children? How can I comfort my wife and my friends? And the answer, of course, is I can't. I, I can't comfort people if I'm not receiving this comfort that comes to God, from God. So the purpose of our comfort is, is, is to comfort others, uh, 2 Corinthians tells us. So how do we do this? How do we get comfort uh, from God? How do we go about uh, getting this? And I want you to think about it uh, maybe in this way, that it depends all and it all rides on what you are exposing yourself to. So right now, understandably so, <clears throat> people are, are thinking about being very intentional about what they are exposing themselves to physically. Uh, they're being careful not to shake hands. Uh, they're social distancing. They're, they're being careful not to go in places where they don't have to expose themselves unnecessarily to uh, potential viruses and bacteria and germs. And, and so people are, are, are washing, they're, they're sanitizing their countertops, they're washing their hands. They're being very careful about what they are exposing themselves to physically because they understand that what they expose themselves to physically can either help them or harm them. And I want you to understand that the same thing is true about your soul, about our spiritual life, that what we expose ourselves to matters. And so if during these, these past few weeks and the weeks coming up, if the only thing that you expose yourself to is Fox News, MSNBC, World Health Organization, CDC, President Trump, if the only thing that is feeding your soul and you're exposing your soul to are these things that are ridden with fear and anxiety, you're going to find yourself locked out of the comfort that God is offering to you. And so one of the things I want to encourage you to do during this time is to intentionally and deliberately expose yourself to the Word of God. That in the midst of the fear, in the midst of the anxiety and the chaos, I want you to take 10 minutes, just 10 minutes, uh, we have, we're going to have find, uh, many of us are going to find some extra time on our hands. Don't use all that time simply to be on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. I want you to take 10 minutes and be very intentional about it. Taking 10 minutes every evening or, or every morning and pausing and opening up the Word of God and exposing yourself to God's words. Not just hanging on to the words of the CDC. I'm not saying that those words aren't important. I'm not saying that, that President Trump's words or the governor's words aren't important. But what we want to do as Christians is understand that the life that I was built for was not meant to feed solely on the words of the president or the governor. That as a, as a Christian, the life that I was built for was to feed on, to, to be built on the word of God. And I want you to pause. I want you to take 10 minutes and perhaps maybe open up 2 Corinthians in uh, chapter 1 or maybe open up Colossians and read that and share it with your spouse and talk about it with your children or your grandchildren. Talk it about with people in your, in your home. And then after 10 minutes, I want you to pause and I want you to reflect on that time and to see what is happening in your heart and your soul, to see whether or not you're more anxious or less anxious. Because I can guarantee you that after spending some time in God's word, you're gonna find that a lot of the fear and a lot of the anxiety will dissipate. I'm not saying that it's all gonna go away magically, but what I am saying is that Christians were built for feeding on the word of God. And so this is what uh, the challenge, the first challenge I want to offer you is to allow yourself to be, allow Christ to be your comfort. Um, that's the first biblical response, I think, uh, to, the, to the chaos and, and to the pandemic uh, that we are facing. Allow God to be your comfort. And one of the ways that we do this is intentionally exposing ourselves to his words. Be careful with what you expose yourself to, not only physically, but spiritually. So that's the first response. The second response, the thing I want us to think about, 
is I want us to think about, and this might seem kind of odd when I say it, uh, it's probably not something that immediately comes to mind when you think about a pandemic or, or suffering or maybe anxiety, but I want us to think about this word um, called repentance. Um, the need and the importance for us to focus on repentance during this time. We need to, uh, we need to think about this. In Luke chapter 13, uh, Jesus uh, says something very interesting. Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Jesus is in, the, in a conversation with, with some people, and it says this in, in, in Luke 13, 1. There were, some pre- uh, there were some present at the very time who told him, talking about Jesus, who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. In verse 2 it says, And he answered them, and he said, Do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? And Jesus responds in in verse 3, No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And so the scene here that we have is that Jesus is in conversation, and there's almost like this breaking news story that happens. Um, Some folks come up and they, they, they tell Jesus about these Galileans who went down to worship, and Pontius Pilate had mingled their blood with the blood of their sacrifices. He killed them. And Jesus' response to those standing around them was, do you think these Galileans who died and suffered in this way, do you think that they were worse off, that they, they were worse sinners than what you were? And Jesus says, no, they weren't. And that's the first thing he tells us. He says, no, it's not. This particular suffering that they experienced was not as the result of a particular sin. Jesus doesn't say that the, that the suffering, that the trial, that the, the persecution that these Galileans went through was because they were worse sinners than anyone else. He says, in a sense, Jesus says they were just like you. The second point Jesus makes here in Luke 13, verses 1 to 3, is he takes the opportunity of this tragedy. He takes the opportunity of this suffering, of this trial, to point the people that are around him to repentance. He says, but nevertheless, if you do not repent, you too will perish. And so one of the things that we see Jesus doing in this, in terms of his application, is he wants people to think about not only their physical mortality, their physical health, physical well-being, Jesus wants them to also think about their spiritual health and their spiritual life. So Jesus takes the opportunity of this tragedy here in Luke chapter 13 to point people to repentance and the need of repentance. So I want you to think about this for a moment. <clears throat> I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine that in your kitchen right now, you knew 100% that in your, on your kitchen countertop uh, that there was the coronavirus, COVID-19 living on your kitchen countertop right now. I want you to imagine you invited somebody over your house at the moment, maybe you didn't realize they were infected with the virus, and they sneezed all over your kitchen table. The table where uh, your children play, the, 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 the place where you prepare food, the place where you cut your vegetables and you, you serve your meals. I want you to imagine that you knew 100% without a shadow of a doubt that the coronavirus was living in your kitchen. How long would you allow that virus to live on your countertop how long would you allow your children or your, your, your husband, your wife, your family members, your loved ones to play, to eat, to prepare meals on that surface before you decided to kill the virus? How long would that be? I would imagine it, not long at all, matter of seconds. As soon as it happened, as soon as you were aware of the situation, you would kill, you would put to death the virus. You would disinfect, you would get out your soap, you, you would clear everybody out of the room. You would do everything that you needed to do to make sure that that was a safe and healthy environment. And what Jesus is saying is essentially basically the, the same thing as this. He wants to take this opportunity of, of these people, this tragedy here in Luke chapter 13, and he wants to point them and say, hey, listen, as, as important as that is, as your physical life is, there's something that is even more important than that, and that is your spiritual life. It is the condition of your soul. And so I'm going to read a passage out of Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. The passage, in a sense, is a list of pandemic viruses. They are a list of things that if you hold on to them, if you cuddle with them, if you kiss them, if you walk with them, if you allow them into your life, they don't have a 3 or 4% mortality rate. The list of viruses I'm about to read to you out of Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 8, have a 100% mortality rate. They are things that God tells us that we need to kill and get rid of out of our life. And so it says this here in Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 8. He says this, Put to death, therefore, 
whatever is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, and look at what he says here in verse 6, on account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked. In these you once walked. In these you, you, allow, you hugged these things. You embraced these things. You shook hands with these things. You kissed these things. You allowed these things into your life. You once walked in them when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your, from your mouth. And so one of the things that the Apostle Paul is telling us here is that the life that we were built for, the life that we were made for, is not a life that has these spiritual viruses in them. They are a life that is clean and clear and separate from these things. And the Apostle Paul is saying we need to put them to death, put them to death. We need to distance ourselves from these things because these do not have a three or four percent mortality rate. These things have a 100 percent wrath of God rate. 100 percent of the time the wrath of God is coming against all forms of ungodliness, including the things on this list. So I want you to imagine that these things in your life, they're just as, if not more so, deadly and toxic to you. One of the things that's kind of shocked me, in, in some ways, and maybe not entirely, I can definitely sympathize uh, with it, is, is the reaction. I mean, we are, as, as a world, as a country, uh, we are willing to bring the entire economy of the world to a halt because we understand the deadly nature of this virus. Three to four percent, perhaps, as the World Health Organization says, of those who contract it could die from it. And because of that three or four percent mortality rate, we're willing to bring the entire world to a halt. We are willing to distance ourselves. We are willing to take extreme measures to make sure that we are separated from these things. And here's what I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, is that the things on this list can kill you too. And I want us to take that same passion, that same tenacity, that same energy that we use to eradicate the coronavirus out of our life, to eradicate the sin out of our life. Slander and gossip and anger and fear and anxiety and lustful passion because the wrath of God is coming against these things. And so one of the things that we have to understand about how do, do Christians respond to moments like this is not just to pause and to think about our physical health. We need to do that. We need to take those things seriously. But we also need to take this as an opportunity and a time to think about our spiritual condition and our spiritual health in the midst of all of this. We need to think about our eternal life and our eternal soul. So a biblical response to the coronavirus is one that includes a pause to reflect on your physical mortality and your eternal destiny. A biblical response to the coronavirus is one that causes the Christian to reflect not only on their physical health, but also their spiritual health. The coronavirus is an opportunity to be reminded that the wrath of God is coming against all ungodliness. And I don't say that to scare you. I don't say that to, to add to fear and anxiety, but rather I say that to prepare you because I love you. The coronavirus is something our bodies weren't made for and wasn't built for. We are afraid of it and don't want it because it is harmful to us. It makes us sick and it weakens us. We are willing to bring the world economy to a screeching halt in order to eradicate this virus because we were not built for it. But here's the thing, brothers and sisters. We weren't built for sin either. You weren't built for sexual immorality or gossip or anger or fear. Use as much passion to eradicate fear and anger and the things on this list out of your life as you would to eradicate the coronavirus. The life you were built for is a life that is free from the pandemic of sin. Let us pray together as we close. Gracious Father, we, we thank you that in the midst of our suffering and in all of our affliction, you are with us to comfort us, to lead us, and to guide us. Lord, we thank you for your words of comfort um, that we can rest in your Holy Spirit. Lord, we also thank you for the words of Jesus out of Luke. Um, that this is a good opportunity and a good moment for us to pause and to consider our mortality, that we are limited creatures and our time here on earth is limited and we need to take that seriously. We need to think about the sin in our life that we have allowed and perhaps became, become complacent with 
that we have allowed in our homes to be around our children and our spouse. Help us, Lord, to attack that sin with the same tenacity and passion as we have this virus. Lord, we thank you for your words. We thank you for the church. We thank you, Father, uh, that this is an opportunity for us to slow down and to be thankful for the many blessings that we have in our life. Lord, I thank you for the Rich Christian Fellowship, and I'm looking forward, Lord, uh, to, the, to the upcoming weeks as we can meet uh, through video and through Facebook, uh, through emails and phone calls. Lord, I pray for, for all of those out there who are fearful, that your spirit would be with them, Lord. I pray for those who are sick with this virus, that you would bring them healing and comfort, Lord, in this time. We thank you, Lord, and we give you praise. In the name of Christ, amen.